Welcome to How to Cook That, I'm Anne Reardon and today I have something exciting. It's new to me, but it's very old. It's called Domestic Cookery by a Lady. Now if we have a look inside, we can see it was given to a beloved wife in 1845. The first edition of this book was printed 216 years ago and they cost a lot of money to get a first edition. This is actually a 67th edition and it's dated 1843, so this one is nearly 180 years old. So who wrote it? Early editions just say, by a lady, which was common at the time. And to give you some insight into that, let me read you this. While man has been characterised as a cooking animal, the capabilities of a woman to undertake even the minor branches of the culinary art have been doubted and denied. All gastronomes of a refined grade unite in denouncing she cooks, and M. Use, when he wishes to express his contempt for any commonplace dish, says a woman can do it. An observation of Dr. Johnson shows upon how very low scale that learned person rated the culinary talents of the sex, women, he remarks, can spin very well, but they cannot write a book of cookery. Well, I'd like to disagree with that one, and even this excerpt goes on to disagree with it. Women have written more extraordinary things since his time, and Mrs. Rundle's excellent work, a work which far surpassed all its predecessors, shows that the Doctor did not do justice to feminine ingenuity. They were having to defend the fact that the cookbook was written by a woman. This book actually sold more than half a million copies in her lifetime. And if we go back a page, it actually says that this little work would have been a treasure to herself, the author, when she first set out in life, and therefore she hopes that it may prove useful to others. In that expectation, it's given to the public, and she will receive from it no emolument. Now that means no profit, she would not get paid for this book. So she trusts that it will escape with no censure or no disapproval. So she gave this book of recipes to a friend, John Murray, who was a publisher, and he published it and put himself down as the copyright owner. Extra recipes have been added into this book with each new edition, but original ones are still marked by ER if they were by Mrs. Rundle. So let's make one of those. Let's try this lemon sponge. To a pint of water, put an ounce of Isinglass. Isinglass comes from the air bladder of fish. Flat fish like this pomfret don't have one, but bony fish like this snapper do. If we take off the fillet, then lift up the ribs and pull this bit out of the way. Oh, I don't really like raw fish. I'm sorry, <laughs> it gets a bit gross. But this is the air bladder here. And it's used by fish to control their buoyancy so they can stay at a depth that they want to without floating up or sinking down. And that makes swimming a lot more efficient for them. I'm going to cut two of these up. I'm not really sure how much I should use here. Sturgeon fish are the most commonly used ones for Isinglass and it's still used today in beers and wines to make it clear, to clarify it. And so why do we need them for this dessert? Well, it's going to help it set. So we put them in a pot with some water and simmer it for several hours until only a small amount of the liquid is left and we'll just strain that into a bowl. After leaving it in the fridge overnight, you can see it's set like a very firm jelly. Now, I'm not sure if they were making this using fresh like I just did or using dried, so that makes the quantities quite tricky. But it does say we need the rind of a lemon, the juice of three, half a pound of sugar, and the isinglass. I'm going to have to warm that up again just to melt it again. In the recipe, they just had it warm from the beginning. They didn't let it set in the fridge, but I wanted to show you that it sets like gelatin. Now we need to add the white of one egg and whisk until it's white and thick. The vintage egg beaters that some of you might be familiar with were not invented for another 40 years, so we're just stuck with a whisk. Electric beaters would be another 40 years after that because there was no electricity yet. Once that is white and thick, I guess we just tip it into a glass. 
Now, I've also repeated this recipe but used gelatin instead of the fish air bladders so that we can compare how they set. What else can we make? This one caught my eye, egg mince pies. It just sounds weird. It has ER there, so we know it was by Eliza Rundle. It says, boil six eggs hard and cut them small. Now, I've boiled these and let them cool. I've never seen a dessert recipe with boiled eggs in it, and that's why I thought this would be interesting. It's said to cut them small, so hopefully that is small enough. I've weighed the eggs so I could then measure double the quantity of chop suet, which is what it said we needed next. This is suet. Suet is fat from red meat like lamb or beef. This really seems like a lot of meat fat for inside a pie. Then it says add a pound of currants, half a pound of chopped raisins and the peel of a lemon grated. Okay, so let's chop some raisins and add those in. Next, the currants and some grated lemon rind. I do wonder if the currants were not dried currants. Like nowadays, if you see currants in a recipe, it does mean dried currants. But back then, I'm wondering if they meant the berries, like red currants. Next, it says add half a nutmeg, a teaspoon of allspice and a little salt. That's the grated nutmeg, the allspice and a pinch of salt. Now it says we need sugar, candied lemon peel, and two glasses of sweet wine. It didn't actually say how much sugar to add, so I'm just guessing here. And there's no quantity for the candied lemon peel either, so I'll just put some in. It's a bit bitter, so I won't put too much on. And then the two glasses of wine, and that's it. It doesn't say what to do with this. But it is in the section of pies, so I assume we mix it all together and then line a pie dish with pastry and tip it in. I can't help but think that once all this suet melts, it's going to be an oily mess. But perhaps it's supposed to be served cold once it's baked, so maybe I'll try that. I did some research on Mrs. Rundell and there's not a lot about her that has been recorded. I couldn't even find any portraits of her. She's a best-selling cookbook author and there's no information. She was born Maria Eliza Kettleby in 1745. She was an only child and she was described as a woman of wealth. When she was 21 years old, she married a surgeon called Thomas Rundle, which is where she gets her last name, obviously. Rundle was one of 16 children, and one of Thomas's brothers worked at a jeweler's in London, and he borrowed money off Eliza and Thomas to buy into the store with his business partner, Bridge. Maria and Thomas went on to have two sons and three daughters. And when she was 50, sadly, her husband passed away. She then apparently travelled and lived with her daughters and obviously wrote books. It says here, the authoress, Mrs Rundle, sister of the eminent jeweller on Ludgate Hill, was afterwards induced to accept the sum of 2,000 guineas from the publisher. With inflation, that's equivalent to about £188,000 today, which is a lot of money and it sounds so nice when it says she was induced to accept it when in fact she took the publisher to court when she was 74 years old over the rights to the book and as a result of that he had to pay her the money. One of their sons ended up working at the jewellery store on Ludgate Hill with his uncle, so it was renamed Rundle and Bridge and Rundle. The store was the principal jewellers and goldsmiths for the royal family, making everything from crowns to candelabras. This was a very successful jewellers, and it may have so outweighed the success of the cookbook there's more written about the jewellery store than there is about Eliza Rundle. A state diamond jewellery in New York who specialise in rare vintage rings have sent me a very old ring for this video. The ring is actually from England originally. I don't think it's from Rundle and Bridge, but I'll get a close up so you can see the hand carving on the side, which is indicative of its age. This was very common in that period. 
Vintage rings like this are one of a kind. There isn't another one that looks the same as this because it is handmade. You can see on the inside it says 1854, but to be honest, anyone could engrave a ring. So you really need an experienced jeweler that you can trust to be able to date old jewelry like this for you. Let's make one more recipe and then taste them all. Here we have a sponge cake by Mrs. Rundle, and it says we need eight eggs, half the whites, three quarters of a pound of sugar, half a pound of flour, a quarter of a pint of water, and the peel of a lemon, and mix as follows. Now this is interesting to me because this is the first old recipe I've seen that has the ingredients listed first and then the directions. Usually it's all just mixed through. Overnight, pare a good sized lemon thin and put the peel into water. And when about to make the cake, put the sugar into a saucepan and pour the water and the lemon peel into it and let it stand by the fire to get hot. Break the eggs into a deep earthen vessel that has been made quite hot. Whisk the eggs for a few minutes with a whisk that has been well soaked in water. I'm not quite sure why the whisk was supposed to be wet, but you might be able to tell me in the comments. Make the sugar and water boil up and pour it boiling hot over the eggs and continue to whisk them briskly for about a quarter of an hour. Wow. This is really hard work, even swapping between Dave and me. A quarter of an hour whisking is a long time. Or until they become quite thick and white, which is proof of their lightness. Have flour well dried and quite warm from the fire and just stir it lightly in. And put the cake into tins lined with white paper and send them immediately to be baked in a moderately hot oven. These have so much air in them that they didn't need baking powder. They rose up nicely as they cooked, but then shrunk back down a little. Well, I think it's time to taste all these goodies. So, here we go. Mm. Mm. It's a bit sort of chewy and dry. Um, flavour is okay, but yeah, just the texture's not quite, it's not quite Anne Reardon. It's almost as if you took a regular sponge and you left it out overnight and then you came back to it the next day. Like, it's not bad and it's not stale, but it's definitely a bit too tough. And also maybe slightly less sweet than what I would expect from a sponge cake. But it's certainly edible. And now onto the boiled egg and suet fruit pie. This looks possibly more dangerous. Um, all right, I'm just delaying because I don't really want to eat it. Mm. I don't mind it, it's sort of fruity and it's got a little bit of a different texture to it. But it's quite pleasant. It feels a bit, um, sort of sticks to the top of your mouth. A little bit sort of uh, oily or buttery. It kind of tastes how it looks. It's just a lot of raisins in some pastry. It might be better hot. Could I taste, could I mm. taste it warm? Well, it's kind of fallen apart now that it's hot. What is in here? Is it actual mince? I liked it better when it wasn't hot. Mix them with double the quantity of chopped suet. That suet. The fat that you can oh, taste. suet's like just pure fat. Meat fat, yeah. Mm. What are they doing with the eggs? Because it doesn't really taste like egg. It's got hard boiled eggs chopped up. That's what those white bits are. Oh, maybe that's why it tasted worse when it was hot. The lemon dessert settled out into two layers with the froth on the top and the lemony bit down the bottom. The one set with the air bladders of fish settled out more so than the one with the gelatin. The foam was a bit more stable on the gelatin one. All right, so this is the 200 year old traditional lemon sponge, did you say? That's what they called it. Okay, let's have a, a little taste. I'm hoping for a lemon meringue pie type of vibe. 
Anything from 200 year old can be a little scary. It's, it's kind of liquidy. I'm not sure if the setting agent really worked that well. It tastes fine. That's not bad. A lemon meringue pie-ish, minus the pie. If there's something weird, if they've blended peasant's feet in there or something, I, I can't taste it. I can't imagine having more than about two or three teaspoons before I just turn into a sugary mess. So in that dessert, they used the air sacs from fish as the gelling agent. Okay. Ah. Oh. Yeah, well, it still tastes fine. I would eat it. Air sacs in fish. Uh, no, I didn't taste that, but it's pretty unappealing. The thought of it. The thought of it, but the thought of gelatin in itself is unappealing. That's made from bones and... Yeah, true, true. So... So if you didn't taste fishy, it's an improvement on the calf. Sure. It's, a, it's an improvement. It's an improvement until you find out what's in it. If you'd like to see more recipes from this book, be sure to like, comment, share and watch more of the 200 year old episodes. With thanks to my wonderful and amazing patrons for your support and encouragement, it means so much to me. Make it a great week and I'll see you on Friday.